everyone. Welcome to today's Expansion Control webinar, a one hour, one PDH credited presentation. My name is Miranda Getling and I'm the Wiesman Academy Manager. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for attending today. We appreciate you taking the time out to attend this webinar. And I hope that you all had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Today, your instructor will be Jody Samuel. Jody is a graduate of Maine Maritime Academy with a degree in Marine Engineering. Over the past 20 plus years, he has worked with various companies, including Amtrol, Wiesman, and Kalefi, serving in various roles, including application engineer, product manager, training manager, and manager for engineering education. Currently, he serves as the project development manager for Wiesman. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. As stated, this is a one PDH credited presentation and we do this through our CEP. Our CEP does require those that would like this credit to fill out a survey, which we will email out to you by the end of the day today. So please make sure that you fill out that survey if you do want the PDH credit. And once that survey is filled out, certificates will be mailed out within five to seven business days. We will email this to you if you want the hard copy via mail, please let me know and I will get that done for you as soon as possible. If you don't require the PDH credit, you will still receive the survey. We ask that you fill this out to help us further improve our webinars. And of course, if you needed to check if you did select our, that you wanted the PDH credit during the registration process, my email will be on the last slide of the presentation today. So feel free to email me to double check on that. Everyone will stay muted throughout the webinar. However, you can ask questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. On the left is the desktop laptop version and on the right is the mobile device version. Jody will be stopping about halfway through the presentation and at the end to answer any questions submitted. So feel free to pop them in there at any time. We will be recording this webinar and it will be posted in our video library within the next two weeks or so. And this video library is located on the Academy website, wiesman usacademycom which is the same one you went to to register for this webinar. And once you're on that site, there are two spots you can go to get to the video library. The first is in the header of the website, or if you scroll down, we have a larger video library section that you can simply click into. Once you click into that video library, this is what you will see. And at the top of the page, we have added in a search function. So you can simply type in expansion control and the video will populate. There may be a button that says discover more that you won't have to hit, but it will be there within the next two weeks. You will also be able to see this in the recorded webinars section of the menu, which includes all of our previous webinars as well that we have conducted. So with that being said, let's begin. Here is Jody Samuel. Thank you, Miranda. So today we're gonna to talk about um, expansion control. And, um, you know, not exactly a Wiesman topic, but from a system standpoint, it's always something good to know. And um, so let's get to uh, move along with it. So a couple of uh, slides up front. Uh, Miranda already talked about this, so uh, we'll pass on that. Uh, the, pro the presentation is copyrighted. However, if you would uh, like the, the information just when you take the survey, just uh, make a note in there and uh, we can get you a, a PDF of the presentation. And here's our learning objectives. It's about expansion control. So when we finish, you should be able to explain why an expansion tank is required. Contrast the design and functionality of an expansion tank and a compression tank. They are similar, but they are different. Describe how an expansion tank is sized and we will work our way through the longhand process of sizing it. And then finally, we'll talk about the best location for the expansion tank as well. Now, when we look at the topic of expansion tanks, uh, as Miranda said in my, the introduction, I worked for, for Amtrol for a period of time. And while I was there, I was product manager for expansion tanks and also I was training manager there. And as such, uh, uh, a document that goes back with me for quite a while is the uh, engineering handbook. And it's still one that uh, information I still think is really good information when it comes to expansion tanks and air separation. And this is a book that was actually printed back in, back in 1977. You're probably not going to find it in print, but if you are interested in it, I'd say go to heatinghelp.com and rummage around the library. And I believe there is a PDF con copy of that, of this manual there as well. So you'll find a lot of the stuff that I utilize is out of here. Uh, you know, it's something that I've, I've been utilizing since back in, I'd say back in 95, and I continue to utilize it. 
Now, when we look at, and I'll, I'll call it the generation of modern closed loop systems, there's, to me, there's always some things, some land, landmarks that are fairly important. If I look over on the left-hand side here, this is not a, a modern closed loop system. This is an old uh, gravity circulation. And you'll notice in here, there is no pump. Circulation occurs because the hotter water is not as dense as the cold water, and the difference in density is what caused that system to circulate. And inside the system up here, you'll notice it says expansion tank. It's an open tank, typically in the, um, the attic of a house that took care of uh, expansion in the system. But to me, when I look at the modern hydronic, particularly from the residential side, residentially, there are two key points to me from a uh, residential side. In 1928, Homer Thrush patented the first residential circulator pump, which all of a sudden started to make forced circulation part of the residential world. And I'm going to jump to the bottom here. In 1958, John White had the first wet rotor circulator for the U.S. market. Again, another important piece of equipment when you look at how our residential hydronic market uh, occurred. Now in 1954, that's the third one, and this is the one that we're going to spend most of our time talking about, Chet Kirk, who was the founder of uh, Amtrol, he introduced the first pre-pressurized expansion tank, and this impacted both the residential and the commercial market, because without this true closed loop circulation with air elimination would not be possible. So this is really responsible for a lot of what we do today. And that's why when somebody talks about expansion tanks, that's why to me, it's, it's a very important piece of the system. Why else is it important? Is, you know, everybody will always kind of think about the expansion tank as one of the accessories, you know, something that's not a big ticket item. And it's just one of the things that show up on the job. But when we look at system design criteria, comfort, life cycle economy, these are generally the things that I talk about when I talk about why we have to do things right. And I look at that expansion tank sitting here and the question always becomes, particularly for an item that is short money compared to instance than buying a boiler, the question always comes up, well, is there really an impact? Does it really make that much of a difference when I start to look at the expansion tank? And the true answer really is, it makes a difference if you want to keep your closed system closed. Because if I don't keep my closed system closed, then I have to start worrying about air elimination. And from an air standpoint, you know, if I get air in the system, there's a good chance that an air handler, say, built high in the system, all of a sudden becomes a trap point for the air because of the fact that my system's not closed. And all of a sudden, comfort is compromised or because of the fact that the expansion tank isn't taking care of expansion, all of a sudden the relief valve starts to let water out, the fill valve puts water back in. Now all of a sudden this closed system becomes an open system and I start to see early failure in individual pieces of equipment. In fact, let's talk about one that, you know, you, you always remember some of these things that happened in the past, Let's talk about one that uh, happened in uh, during my, my career in the industry. So we're going back to the 1990s. The year was 1994, in fact, okay? Now, the equipment on the left-hand side, I don't have the ability uh, you know, for you to respond here, but you, know, you look at this, my question is, what is this? Somebody out there is looking at that and they're saying, that's a heat maker. And in fact, it was a heat maker among, you know, not listed in the, the companies that I work for, I worked for Heatmaker for a short period of time in the, the, the early 90s, okay? And with this Heatmaker was one of my early lessons in expansion tank sizing and system design. So the year was 94 and there was a problem. And this problem was in an apartment complex outside of Boston. So it wasn't happening in a single building, it was happening in a, a couple dozen installations. So these boilers were un in unheated spaces, you know, basically a, like a, a shelter built onto the back of the apartment building that had the build, boiler and also I think they were used for storage as well. Because it was outside of the building, it, it contained 50% antifreeze. So it was a 50-50 mixture, okay? And they used a size 15 extra in the application. Size 15 extra is about a two gallon tank. 
the complaint was they got no they had no heat you know so they were losing uh, every every once in a while they were losing boilers and it wasn't just one boiler it was boilers all over the place now why they were i say they were losing boilers what physically they weren't they were losing is right behind this electric panel is a pump a wet rotor circulator the one we were talking about and um, periodically they would have these pumps seize up. You looked at the pump, the reason they seized up was it was corrosion products getting into the pump itself, okay? Why did that happen? Well, as it turns out that Model 15 x was properly sized if the system was filled with water, but that system was filled with 50% antifreeze, propylene glycol, and all of a sudden the, um, the expansion was much greater than they anticipated. So from an aspect of comfort, the comfort certainly wasn't there. And from the aspect of longevity of equipment, these wet rotor circulators, these Taco 007s that were in the boiler weren't lasting nearly as long as they anticipated. So when you start to look at the, the overall goals of a project, expansion certainly matters, okay? Now, how much of expansion are we really talking about? Here's a chart out of uh, Amtrol's engineering handbook. And this looks at the net expansion of water. There are other ones for glycol mixes as well in this manual. But if I look at the net expansion of water, what I'm looking at is the initial water temperature that the system is either filled with or in a static you know, off-season condition where everything drops down to the ambient temperature of the building versus your final temperature. So the water is gonna go from a temperature swing and as that temperature changes, so does the, the, um, the amount of physical, physical amount of water in the system from a volume standpoint. So let's say my initial water temperature was 70 degrees Fahrenheit, ambient temperature in the building. And when it gets into the highest part of the heating system, the coldest day of the year, I need 180 degree water. If I look at that combination, that tells me the expansion factor is 0.0261. 0.0261, or the system gains 2.61% of its volume going from cold to hot. Now, with the expansion tanks, our goal is to give this water somewhere to go. Now, ultimately, when you start to look at expansion tanks, you know, a conversation I've had with a few people with this is purpose versus function. And with the expansion tank, it's about accommodating the water, okay? The real reason for the expansion tank is I wanna keep my closed system closed because if I don't accommodate the water, the relief valve, which is a safety device, will then have to open up and let the water out. So ultimately when I size the expansion tank, it's not just about giving the expanded water somewhere to go, but if it's properly sized, the expansion, the relief valve on the system doesn't lift. So that's our ultimate goal when we start to design a system and size an expansion tank for that system, okay? Now, to make this happen, we have to talk a little bit about science. So when I look at doing a, a, a expansion tank, I have to go to science and I'm looking for something that's specifically called Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law is essentially an application of what's known as the ideal gas equation. Boyle's law in um, equation form, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. In words, it's, it's a defined parcel of gas. The pressure volume product is constant, is the, the fancy way of saying it. For our application, for what we're doing, let's come over here and take a look. So if I have a given amount of gas that has a defined volume and a defined pressure, let's call that pressure one and volume one, Okay, if I change, we'll go with volume, if I change the volume, so let's say I take this tank and I bring water in and I start to compress the air, as I compress the air, the volume goes down, but because the product of these two being multiplied together is constant, if the volume goes down, the pressure has to go up, okay? So from an aspect of expansion tanks, I bring water into the expansion tank, the volume decreases, the pressure increases. So if, a vo if an expansion tank is doing its job and or in order for the expansion tank to do its job, the pressure does have to change. So it may be that cold 
pressure in the expansion tank is 12 PSI. Depending on how the expansion tank is sized, when it gets, the water gets hot, when the system gets hot, that 12 PSI may be 15, may be 18, may be 25. But ultimately, that pressure will change but ultimately, it's, it's, if it's sized right, the pressure never gets high enough that the relief valve lifts. And that's really um, part of the criteria of designing the system for, for expansion. Okay. Now, when we start to look at expansion control, pressure and pressure control, there are really two different ways of going about it. Okay? The first one, and the, the first one is what's referred to as air control. And when we talk about air control, we're, we're talking about really air separation, but when it comes to expansion tank design, air control uses one style of expansion tank, something called a compression tank. And in air control, we're not eliminating the air from the system, we're controlling the movement of air in the system. And when I say movement, we're talking about move, physical movement of air bubbles, but also the movement of air in and out of solubility. So that's air control and it, it works with what's referred to as a compression tank. When we do air elimination, air elimination is actually about physically removing the air bubbles from the system, getting them out of the system itself. Okay, so it's about eliminating the free air in the system. And if I want to do air control, I have to use a different style of tank which is referred to as a pre-pressurized expansion tank. Let's take a look at these two tanks in contrast. Okay. So if I do a compression tank, if I'm doing air control, I do a compression tank. You'll also may hear it referred to as a plain steel a, a compression tank. Now the compression tank has no separation from between the air and the water. Okay. So the air and the water come in direct contact. And what you have is the piping connection comes in off of the bottom. The, it, the tank is full of air, the air is trapped. And how we build pressure is we utilize Boyle's law. We bring water in and we compress the air till I get to the pressure that the system needs. The thing with the compression tank is the compression tank always has a certain portion of its volume sitting there with water in it to build that pressure. So the entire volume of the tank is not available to control pressure when the temperature of the system changes. Now, on the flip side, we have the pre-pressurized diaphragm tank. And you know, you listen, you'll, you'll notice I mentioned it's pre-pressurized. It's pre-pressurized expansion tank. Everybody tends to shorten it down just to expansion tank. So in the pre-pressurized tank, there now is a divider between the air and the water. It could be a diaphragm or it could be a bladder separating the air and water. So I have that level of separation. And the key point here is because of that separation, over here, I always have water in the tank to build pressure. Over here, this diaphragm allows me to pre-pressurize, charge that tank with air to the pressure I need in the system. So there's always gonna be a lot, there's gonna, not gonna be the wasted volume in the system that you see here. Now with the compression tank, we talked about this already, water is brought into the bottom of the tank, compressing the air. And as I compress the air, I build pressure. Question always comes up, how much water or what percentage of that tank volume has to be full of water to, to get this pressure up, okay? We come back to Boyle's law, P1 V1 equals P2 V2, okay? where one is the whole tank of just air in it, two is the compressed air volume when I've brought that air, when I've brought the water in and compress it up. If I move it around, I'm solving for V2. What's this volume here? I'm not going to assign a value for V1 because I want it as a fraction. So I simply divide P1 by P2. So if I'm saying I want to have 12 PSI in the tank and I don't want to, and I want to generate 12 PSI in the tank, with this, you notice I'm not starting off at zero. This calculation happens in absolute. So zero PSI is 14.7 at sea level. It's a little bit different if you're in Denver, Colorado. And when I'm at 12 PSI, I don't have 12 PSI gauge pressure. I have 26.7 PSI absolute pressure. I do my math. That's telling me that 
my, my volume at the very end is 55% of the original volume. Or in order to pressurize this compression tank to 12 PSI, I have to fill the tank about 45% full of water. So right off the bat, when I start to do a compression tank and I'm looking at how big the tank has to be, about half of the tank's volume is wasted pre-pressurizing the tank by bringing that water in. And that water stays in there all the time. Some other numbers, okay? At 12 PSI, it's about half full of water at static pressure. At 30 PSI, we're about two thirds full. So you only, now we're utilizing one third of that tank to accept water when you heat that system up. If you have a system that's 70 PSI, 83% of the volume has the water that's generating the 70 PSI by compressing the air up. So the thing when I start to do compression tanks, particularly at the high pressure, there's a lot of volume that's wasted and just generating the pressure. And this is one of probably the major downfalls of using a compression tank to generate pressure in the system. Okay. Now, when I go to a pre-pressurized tank, it could be a diaphragm or a bladder separating the, the air and the water. Now with that separation, the tank can be pre-pressurized. Okay. So if it's at 12 PSI, the air charge represents 100% of the volume of the tank. If it's at 70 PSI, the tank's volume represents 100% of the pre-charge. It's not where you know, 83% of it is holding water. So when I do a pre-pressurized tank, the tanks are smaller, generally about half the size at 12 PSI, considerably smaller when you start to get to the higher pressures. Okay? Also with the pre-pressurized tanks, you know, air elimination now becomes something that I can do because I don't have to worry about the air going into solution. And as I said, makes air elimination possible. Um, down the road, if we continue to work uh, from remote with the COVID-19, I think you will see a presentation on air elimination as well, probably later on. But all of a sudden, because of this, you know, the, the pre-pressurized tank starts to bring a lot of benefits into the picture that I just don't have with the compression tank. Okay. Now, actually, I want to back it up here a minute. The other thing also with the compression tank, as I fill these tanks up, the thing with the compression tank is it has to be located above the boiler. So all of a sudden you have all of this dead weight either sitting on a stand that is taller than the boiler to get it up above the boiler or trying to be suspended from the, the roof, the, the roof above. So, you know, we start to look at that, that helps in that, that method as, as well. Now, when I do pre-pressurized tanks, there's a couple of different versions, okay? So you'll have what's called the diaphragm tank. Now, the diaphragm tank, you're gonna have a flexible diaphragm separating the water and the air side of the tank. And you'll have the air charge here and you'll see the water up here. Now, with the diaphragm tank, from a design standpoint, the diaphragm is actually designed to invert when water comes into the tank. The diaphragm is not designed to stretch. You know, by keeping it so it's just inverting and coming back, it will give us a much longer life cycle out of the tank than if, if we did try to design it to, to stretch out. So properly sized, it's going to have what's referred to as acceptance volume. The acceptance volume is when that diaphragm is fully, the max acceptance is when that diaphragm is fully inverted. But again, it doesn't stretch, it simply flexes back and forth as the water heats and expands and cools and contracts. Now, the other direction we can go with expansion tanks are what's referred to as bladder tanks. So physically, there's not a flexing diaphragm, there's a bladder built internally. So the bladder can be what's called a full acceptance bladder, and this happens to be top connection, full acceptance. In full acceptance, the volume of the bladder is exactly the same volume as the tank. So if I have a, a 500 gallon tank, I have a 500 gallon bladder. The other way it can go is what's called the partial acceptance. This happens to show partial acceptance with bottom connection. Now, in a partial acceptance, the bladder's volume is less than, than the entire tank volume. So I may have a 500 gallon tank, but over here, unlike having a 500 gallon bladder, over here, the partial acceptance bladder may only be 250 gallons. So it's less than the entire volume of the system because from an aspect of application, in most cases, 
when I look at how much water and how much acceptance I'm going to need, in most cases, I'm probably only seeing maybe 50, possibly 60% of the entire tank's volume accepting water. Because of Boyle's law, there is no way that I can squeeze this air down to, in most cases, any mo anything less than maybe 40% of the original volume under the pressures that we operate. So from a partial acceptance, you know, you're actually better sizing the bladder to the actual performance. But from a standpoint, you do have the full acceptance here, the partial acceptance there as well. So those are options. So we start to do expansion tanks. We have the diaphragm tanks, the bladder tanks and full acceptance design and partial acceptance. From an application and from a sizing standpoint, they're all actually sized and applied exactly alike, okay? Now, to give you a little bit of a breakdown or a difference when somebody's looking at the, um, the, the, um, the compression tank versus the uh, pre-pressurized tank, you know, I kind of alluded to this early on when we were talking, but if we look at it from a different standpoint, here's an application, I'm not gonna go through the details for it, but if I size it for a plain steel compression tank, I need a tank that's 1,520 gallons in size and at minimum operating pressure, that tank is going to weigh 13,800 pounds. And that's before I accept the expanded water, okay? At temperature, the 1380, 800 becomes 14,569 pounds. So a big tank and a lot of weight to support, especially when you know that has to be above the boiler. If I do the same system with a diaphragm tank, 356 pound, gallons, fully full of water at maximum acceptance, it's 1,737 pounds. And this is a tank you can mount on the floor. So that's kind of the power of getting away from this compression tank and moving to a diaphragm expansion tank. Okay? And the thing is, this looks at the, the space ratio between this tank and that tank. But if I'm running 100 PSI on the system, the diaphragm tank is only 13% of the total volume that it would run with a system like that. So there's some real advantages to do with the diaphragm tank. And that's why if you look at the, the market, you know, residentially, it's pretty much shifted over to the diaphragm tank. Commercially, I would say for the most part, it's also a pre-pressurized tank market as well. Okay. Now, let's talk about sizing these tanks. Okay. So if I'm trying to size an expansion tank, and I know this is the formula that governs the operation of that tank on the air side, there are a few things that I can pull out of here that I know I'm going to need to size that tank. So first off, if I know I'm changing the volume by bringing water into the tank, the first thing I need to know is how much water is going to enter that tank. And for that, I need to know the total system volume and I need to know the expansion factor. That's gonna tell me what what kind of ex ex acceptance, if you will, that expansion tank needs to uh, hold that water. Now, the other thing here is I have a P1 and a P2. Pressure here when my system is cold or the pressure that's going to be in that tank when I've started to add water. So I need two pressures to work off of, okay? Or what's the static pressure of the system? And since my goal is to keep that system cold, what's the pressure rating of the relief valve? So these are really the, the informa pieces of information needed to size an expansion tank. Now, when I, get, when I start to look at this information, a couple of things stand out immediately, okay? And these are more on the pressure side. That's the easy side to work with. So when I look at choosing a pressure, you know, I have some requirements on that pressure. So, First thing that I wanna make sure is the water in my system doesn't boil. So I have to look at my pressure to prevent boiling. And that's really a, a minimum pressure on the system. Now, most boilers are gonna have a, a fixed high limit in the neighborhood about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I look at that temp 210 degrees Fahrenheit and then add enough positive pressure so I have some room that even if I get up to 210, the possibility of the water boiling in the system doesn't exist because I have additional pressure, okay? That pressure is five PSI. 
So whenever I look at pressurizing the system, everywhere in the system, I got to ensure that I have a minimum of five PSI at that spot in the system. Now, the other thing that comes into play on the bottom here, is if I look at air vents, most of your air vents need a minimum of two PSI for them to be positive acting. Yeah, from a design standpoint, I don't worry about that. I'm gonna just concentrate here on that five PSI to prevent boiling. If I have the boiling covered, I absolutely have the air vents covered. Okay. So when I start to look at minimum pressures of the system, let's look at the boiler and the expansion tank down in the basement of the building, and then the building is built above it. So our goal is when I fill that system up is I got to make sure water gets all the way to that top of the system. So we have to look at it from the aspect of how much static pressure is being generated by the height of a building. So if I look at your typical two story building, you know, you'll have to take an expansion tank It's probably pre pressurized to 12 PSI. You don't think anything about it. You just put it in the building knowing you have it covered. This is why you have it covered. If I look at that a water column. For every foot of water column, which the static pressure head represents, one foot of water column represents 0.433 PSI. I know that at the top of the system, I have to have an additional five PSI to suppress boiling and make sure there's enough pressure at the air vents so I can calculate where that 12 PSI comes from. So let's say that this is 16 feet tall. I take that 16 feet, I multiply it by the 0.433, that gives me seven PSI of water pressure if I just fill the system up and I get it up to here. But if I put a gauge up here and I measure pressure, there's gonna be zero PSI. I need an extra five. So I take that seven, I add an extra five for positive pressure. That gives me 12 PSI, which is your typical two house number, which is also the pressure that Expansion tanks are pre-charged to coming from the manufacturer and most fill valves are set to as well. That's where that number comes from. But when I start to look at the building, if it's not, if the, the system is not 12 PSI, I have to go through this process to calculate what that pressure needs to be if the boiler and the expansion tank are in on the ground floor or in the basement of the building. It does become a little bit different if I have a penthouse boiler room, or, and I'm starting to look at net positive suction head required for the pumps. So these two play a little bit different to um, the calculation. So all of a sudden, the boiler is no longer down here. Let's move it up here into the top of the building. Let's bring the expansion tank with it. Let's bring the fill valve with it. So the fill valve and the expansion tank are set to 12 PSI. Do I need 12 PSI? Well, maybe not. You know, we look at it and say, okay, I need 0.433 PSI per foot above the expansion tank. At the top of the building, there are zero feet above the expansion tank. That calculation goes away. I need five PSI positive pressure. Let's start to focus on that. So if I have zero feet above the expansion tank, that means there's zero PSI gauge pressure to account for the static. That means my five PSI positive pressure is actually the five PSI that I should fill my expansion, drop my expansion tank pressure down to and set my fill valve. That gives me sufficient pressure to suppress boiling and make sure any um, air vents that are in the mechanical room on the top of the building are suppressed. Unless the pump requires more for right here, net positive suction head. So when we look at the, the pressure in the system, I have to make sure that I meet the pump manufacturer's requirement for net positive suction head. So if I was sizing my pump here, here's my system curve, here's the pump curve, there's my size, I come straight up. This curve here represents net positive suction head. You know, let's bring that all the way across to the scale. That's about eight feet. Eight feet, somewhere around three and a quarter PSI. Three and a quarter is less than my five, I'm good to go. But if it's a high head pump, all of a sudden I may set the design the expansion tank pressure and the fill pressure to make sure that the minimum pressure out there meets the pump's requirements. So a little bit different when we look at the penthouse boiler room 
versus the mechanical room in the first ground floor or the basement of the building. So something to think about when choosing your minimum pressure, okay? Now, when it comes to sizing, a couple of different approaches to it. Uh, residentially, we see very little sizing happening from an actual calculation standpoint. It really is all about let's work off of a chart. So here's a standard chart. This happened to come out of uh, uh, Amtrol's literature. You know, Taco, Bell and Gossett, Wessels, everybody that has a residential tank has a, uh, um, a chart very similar to this. And the calculation has already been done and then tied to the type of heat rate, heat emitters, and the net of the boiler. So if I have fin tube baseboard and I have a boiler that nets out at 100,000 BTUs, I want to have a Model 30 uh, expansion tank, a 4.4 gallon tank. And that 4.4 gallon tank will take care of the expansion with assumptions made on water content based on the type of radiation and the size of the boiler, recognizing that these charts are probably at least 30 years old, so they are a very large mass boiler, with a 12 PSI filter pressure, 30 pound relief valve setting, and 200 degrees Fahrenheit av average water temperature. So very conservative numbers, you know, you talk to guys that have used it long, a long time and they'll say, you know what, it's never gone wrong. And in fact, when I tell people that I expect the pressure to get up into the 20, 30, 20, 25 pound range with a residential system, they're like, it's impossible. I've never seen anything above 15. It's because of how forgiving this type of sizing is, but it's quick and it's easy. And if you look at the calculations, which I kind of work my way back through, if I look at that size 30 tank, that 4.4 gallon tank under everything that's highlighted here, that 4.4 gallon tank is good for a system filled with water that contains 45.7 gallons of water. So a pretty substantial system, especially when you look at current systems with low mass boilers. So, kind of a tease into the sizing side of things. We're kind of at a point where we probably should look at if there are any questions. So let's take a look at what we have here. Are there any questions? Uh, looks like the Q&A box is still empty. We'll have questions. If your thing comes up, please throw them in there and uh, we will press forward. So if I am doing a system, I want to, we will eventually talk about other methodology, but I wanted to work through what's called a critical sizing, the longhand calculation to size the tanks. The way I was doing them back in the early 90s, if you will. Okay, so when we size it, it's a matter of getting the right information in and then doing the calculation. And um, so from an information standpoint, I know the water has to expand and I know the tank has to accommodate that water. So that's what this information is all about. Total system water content has to be known, the temperature when the water is filled and the temperature when the system is at design temperature. So this is used to calculate how much water is expanding and has to go into the tank. Minimum pressure and maximum pressure, that's gonna determine how much of that tank's volume is utilized storing that water, which ultimately can give me the actual size of the tank. So it's about pulling that information in. Now, tough one always is system water content. I always found this interesting. This is out of Amtrol's engineering handbook, and it's something that's been around for a while. And back when I was working for Amtrol, it, it, it worked very well. It, you know, we actually ended up with it oversized somewhere between 10 and 25%, but it's just looking dimensionally at the building and from the dimensions of the building, to make an estimate of the total water content. And how it's done is by this formula right here. So if I look at the, the building as a block with three dimensions, a width, a depth, and a height, I choose the two largest dimensions, add them together, multiply that by four, that's the constant, and then multiply that by gallons per linear foot of pipe for the largest water mean in the hydronic system, and that will come up with a water content for, reboil, for the building. Nowadays, there's enough pro pro programs out there that you probably can find a program that will come up with a calculation as well. But this was an easy way to estimate it back in the day when uh, computers weren't as prevalent uh, out there in the market. And then actually, 
you know, work pretty good at coming up with a quick answer. For our calculation, I'm just going to put some values out there to work with. So the system has 1,800 gallons of water. There's a 75 pound relief valve on the boiler. It's a basement install within, in a nine story building. And my max water temperature is gonna be 180 degrees. That's all of the information I need to size it. So let's go in here and fill it in. Here's my 1800 gallons of total water content, okay? Here is my temperature fill point, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Maximum temperature is gonna be 180. Um, these two numbers can be argued. Yeah. We have, you know, 50 maybe when it's being filled, but after I fill, purge, vent the system um, and start to run the system, you know, the system really is not going to see anything less, left than seven, less than 70 degrees. So let's size off of 70. You know, my design water temperature is 180. The actual average water temperature is 170. So let's size it for 170. So that will, if I change these two, it will change the calculated volume, but in most cases, it won't change the actual tank volume. But you can't play with that if you're trying to find, if you can get to a little slightly smaller tank. Minimum operating pressure at the X roll is 50 PSI. Where the 50 came from is I calculated the static head of a nine story building with basement and added five pounds of positive pressure, came out to about 50 PSI. I wanted to use numbers directly off the chart, so I rounded to the nearest uh, uh, 10. Minimum operating pressure, I had a 70, 75 pound relief valve. I wanna make sure that that relief valve doesn't weep or leak at all. So um, that weeping or leaking happens about within 5% of the value. So I wanted to get outside of it. Normally it's a 10% number, but again, I didn't have a column on the chart for 67 and a half. So I rounded that up to 70, okay? So let's start on the bottom here. So here I'm going to carry down the total system water content. And then uh, for line seven here, I'm going to find the net expansion factor going to the expansion chart with 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I enter this expansion chart for water, here's 50 degrees Fahrenheit, my initial temperature. Here's 180 degree temperature, my final temperature. That's telling me my expansion factor is 0 0.0275. Okay, so that's fractionally the, uh, the expansion that's gonna happen. So let's carry these two numbers over to uh, our sizing. So here's my 1800 gallons of water. Here's my expansion factor of 0 0.0275. If I multiply the two together, that will give me my total expansion volume. That comes up to 49.5 gallons. So that's the amount of water that has to go into the expansion tank when the system is at operating pressure. The next thing I have to do is calculate the acceptance factor or what percentage of the full tank volume will accommodate this heat, will have to accommodate this water between these two pressures. So it's about 50 PSI, beginning and 70 final pressure. So if I come in here, here's my 50 minimum pressure. Here's my 70 final pressure. That gives me an acceptance factor of 0 0.236. So when the temperature is at seven, when the system is at temperature and it's at a 70 PSI pressure, about a quarter of that tank's volume is going to be water, and about three quarters of the tank's volume is going to be air. So let's carry these, that number in here. Here's my 2375. To get the full tank volume, I divide my 49.5 by, by, by 0.236, and that tells me that for this application, I need a 210 gallon expansion tank. Okay. So if it's full acceptance, I get a 210 gallon tank. If it's partial acceptance, I want a 210 gallon total volume tank with an acceptance volume of at least 49 and a half gallons. So there is a little bit difference when you're doing partial acceptance in that you're not just looking at the full volume of the tank, but you look at the full volume and you have to look at the acceptance volume based on this number here. So from an aspect of doing it longhand, that's the calculation. Now, earlier we talked a little bit about the penthouse boiler room. The penthouse boiler room can, can do a, play a major factor in the actual size of the expansion tank. It doesn't affect 
the water content, it doesn't affect the maximum minimum temperature, and it doesn't affect the average water temperature as well. But right here is where it can, be make, can make its big impact on the pressures. So if I do a, pre, a penthouse boiler room, there's no system above the boiler. So all of a sudden that 50 PSI that I'm sizing off of down in the, the mechanical room in the building becomes five PSI based on my minimum positive pressure, assuming it's enough pressure for net positive suction head. And on uh, most of these applications, when they pull the boiler up into the mechanical room, they pull out that 75 pound relief valve, they put a 30 pound on. But if I have a 30 pound relief valve, that still tells me that the maximum pressure that I can achieve at the boiler, which is really at the expansion tank is 27. 90% yeah. of my relief setting. So I now, rather than bringing the expansion tank between 5 and 70, excuse me, 50 and 70, I'm now going 5 to 27. If I look at that from the aspect of acceptance factors, here's 5 and here's 27. My acceptance factor all of a sudden jumps up to 0.572. That's a, a lot different than my acceptance factor of 0.236, much higher acceptance factor under these conditions. So if I bring it all in here, those are my, my range. My acceptance factor becomes 0.572. I still have 49.5 gallons of water. I divide 49.5 by 0.572. My expansion tank is now a 94 gallon expansion tank. Yeah, so 94 gallon expansion tank versus 210. Same building, same system. It's just when I bring it into the, the penthouse because of the change in the operating pressure, dramatically reduces the size of it. Personally, I love penthouse boiler rooms and this happens to be one of the reasons why. So this is the way we go through when we size the expansion tank, okay? Now, with that expansion tank that I just sized, it's important that even though the tank comes pre-pressurized at 12 PSI, the pressure in the expansion tank has to be pre-charged for the existing conditions where the expansion tank is located. So for instance, if I go back to my residential building with my 4.4 gallon tank with a 12 PSI pre-charge, let's say it's not going into a two-story building. Let's say it's going into three stories. Maybe it's one of these that the ceiling height is 12 or 14 feet. But when I look at the static pressure of the system, static plus five pounds of positive pressure, all of a sudden I get to a situation where my fill pressure is 20 PSI. So 20 PSI is now needed to get five pounds of positive pressure on the top of the system. If I do not match the pre-charge with that 20 PSI, I'm gonna just kind of throw this out here quickly. All of a sudden, because of Boyle's law, I am going to lose volume as I bring water into that tank to pressurize the existing air charge and, press, and compress it down till I get to 20 PSI. The net result is if I do this, my 4.4 gallon tank by not matching the pre-charge is now essentially a 3.4 gallon tank. So from the aspect of sizing, you now right, run the possibility that if the expansion tank was close in size to what actually is needed for the system, the expansion tank now may be slightly undersized. So please make sure you match the pre-charge with the existing conditions. Now, the other thing to consider is glycol in the system, okay? Glycol expands much differently than water. So here is a expansion chart for 40% purpling glycol. So if I take a system from 50 PSI to 180, and I look at the numbers for glycol, glycol has an expansion factor of 0 0.495, okay? Round, you know, let's put some numbers to this. If I have a 100 gallon system, I fill it with glycol, I bring it all the way up from 50 to 180 degrees, the expansion factor is 0 0.0495. That means that when the system is at temperature, the, the expansion tank has to have the ability to accept 4.95 gallons of water propylene glycol mix. If I compare that to water only, water only under the same temperature conditions, 
has an expansion factor of 0 0.275. So for that same 100 gallon system, the acceptance volume is 2.75, okay? So there is quite a difference in the, ex the expansion tank size to accept 2.75 gallons versus 4.95. So when you're doing systems with polypropylene glycol, the expansion tank size has to be done recognizing you have glycol with the proper chart to properly accommodate it. Otherwise, you're going to run into issues like that apartment complex back at the beginning outside of Boston with the little size 15 expansion tanks. Okay. Now, when this is all said and done, there's an easier way. You don't have to be like me back in the, early, the, the late 90s, grinding out by hand uh, a critical sizing on an expansion tank. Your, your tank manufacturers, Amtrol, Taco, Belling Gossett, Wessels, I think everybody has a program uh, on an app on their site to size the tank. It's a much easier application to work your way through, and I highly recommend you use that to size. But again, this is the way expansion tanks are sized when somebody says, I want to size an expansion tank. But no matter what your approach is, you're going to have to find these five pieces of information, whether I'm doing it longhand or whether I'm doing it from uh, one of these programs. Okay. Now, one last thing to talk about, and that's about location of the expansion tank. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the term point of no pressure change. Um, point of no pressure change is a little bit of a misnomer. Okay, Where I put my expansion tank, I expect the pressure to change based on the change in water temperature. Back to Boyle's law, in order to expand water, in order to accommodate expanded water, I either have to compress the air or expand the air. That tells me that at the expansion tank, the pressure will change, but it changes with the changing of volume in the system because of the change in temperature, okay? When we talk about point of no pressure change, it's really all about the relationship between the expansion tank and the pumps in the system. Pumps do not change the volume of the system. Pumps generate a delta P or a differential pressure which moves the water through the system and that delta P is the relationship between the friction loss in the system and the pump that's that selected. So we talk about the point of no pressure change. It's all about where I, I connect the, sit, the tank into the system whether the pump is running or the pump is run or not, is the system static or the system dynamic, the pressure will not change. Once I throw the boiler and heating the system up, I do expect that pressure to change. So when I look at the location, the real relationship isn't really between the boiler, the expansion tank, and the pump for the point of no pressure change. It's really about the relationship between the expansion tank and the pump itself, okay? When the boiler comes in, that's, that's about air elimination, totally different topic. But I can put the expansion tank on the, the discharge side of the pump. The pump's performance is all about this grid up here, the pump curve. So here is the system curve here in blue. The pump curve here is in red. That's my operating point. That's the number of feet that the, of head that that pump is gonna generate in balance. It has no bearing on this here, okay? So what happens is the expansion tank comes in, that becomes the point of no pressure change because the, what the pump is doing here is generating head pressure as dictated by that relationship. But I put the expansion tank in, point of no pressure change, that locks it in. Now when the pump generates its delta P, it needs a reference point, that's the expansion tank. And if it's on the discharge side of the pump, in order to generate the head pressure, what you're actually going to see is a drop in the suction pressure, okay? The pump's head pressure is subtracted from the static pressure of the system. Now, system pressure is chosen for very specific reasons. It's about positive pressure on the system. It's about positive pressure at your air vent. It's about net positive suction head. If I've chosen this pressure for a very specific reason, I don't want to be subtracting from that pressure. You know, it's moving me further away from what I designed. It's, it's not conducive to the proper operation of the system. So when I look at the relationship between the expansion tank and the pump, okay, I can move the expansion tank to the dish suction side of the pump. 
nothing over here changes. Same pump curve, same system curve, same operating point. Same delta P across the pump. But now my reference point is on the suction side of the pump. So what I see is the head pressure is additive over the static pressure of the system. So by having it additive, if this is the minimum pressure I want to see, because of everything we've discussed, air vents, positive pressure, net positive suction head, this adds, adds pressure to the system, particularly for my, net, my, um, my air vents and particularly for my minimum pr measure, pressure to suppress boiling, it becomes a much better installation, a much you know, a hydraulically stable or hydraulically correct application, if you will. So from a design standpoint, we want that expansion tank on the suction side of the pump so the head pressure is additive. Okay. Now, another component that we do need to throw in here, when we talk about the location of the expansion tank, is the location of the fill valve. So if the, pre, if the, minimum, if the pressure at the expansion tank, the minimum pressure at the expansion tank is 12 PSI or 30 PSI or 60 PSI, if I'm using a fill valve or any kind of device to fill the system, I also want that same pressure. So if I have 30 pounds here, I want 30 pounds there. So the key is I want these to work in conjunction with each other. And to get them to work in conjunction with each other, let's pipe them together and bring them into a single point in the system. Okay? If they come into any kind of separation between the two, the minute I start to go into a dynamic situation, now friction loss comes into play. And with friction loss, I end up with two points in the system with different pressures, but they're both trying to control at the exact same pressure. So if I tie them in together, they work off of the same point, they see no variation that between the two of them, and they, they help each part of the system function the way they should. So from a design standpoint, where I, when I look at the expansion tank, I expect to see the fill valve teed in with it, and then the pair of them teed into the system. And that T-in connection is on the suction side of the pump. If I do a primary-secondary connection, I want all pumps in the system pumping away. So here, I happen to be using a, a low-loss head of manifold system with a manifold across the bottom that is designed for um, the proper velocity where I have very low pressure drop across it. So you happen to see the, here's my fill valve coming in here. Here's my expansion tank and they're coming in together. And then if I look at here, here's my pumps going into the boilers, pumping away from my expansion tank. Here's my system pumps pumping away from the expansion tank with a point of no pressure change. So system pumps and boiler pumps are both building above the minimum pressure in the system. Okay. You may see them in here. Sometimes you'll see the expansion tank fill valve combination in here. Sometimes you'll see it tucked in here as well. But all three of these examples, whether it's here, here, or out here with the manifold racking system, it all sets up the system so that all pumps are pumping away from the expansion tank so we're adding head pressure when we bring it into the boiler. We're adding head pressure when we build out into the system, increasing the pressure above the minimum system pressure required. So we covered a lot of ground in one hour. Okay. We talked about why the expansion tank is required. It's to accommodate the water. And by accommodating the water, it is going to make sure the relief valve in the system doesn't leak. It's not maintaining a constant pressure. Pressure has to change to accommodate that water, but we're minimizing or we're controlling the rise in system pressure. We talked about the design and functionality of expansion tank and the differences between that and a compression tank. And with the expansion tanks, we talked about the three vari variations, the diaphragm tank, the full acceptance bladder tank, and the partial acceptance. We talked about sizing, the easy residential sizing method, and then we did a critical sizing. So you saw the methodology behind it. And then we talked about the best location for an expansion tank. So uh, before we wrap up, let's go back and see what we got for questions. I think I saw a couple of them pop up there. 
We do have a couple of questions, Jody. The first one, how do you determine operating pressure in a commercial hot water system? Okay, so how you determine the, the operating pressure, um, and I'm gonna go operating pressure, actually, I'm gonna, the, there's another one here. Can you clarify how you determine max operating pressure? So I'm gonna actually back up here for that. And what we're really doing is we're, we're when I when I do this, I'm looking at it from the aspect of where the expansion tank is. So here I have my expansion tank sitting here. My goal is to make sure that this boiler relief valve and that boiler relief valve both do not lift. So when I look at the minimum pressure on the system, I'm going to say, okay, based on where this tank is located, I'm going to look at the elevation of the system. Okay. So I'll, I'll work easy numbers. So let's say this system is a um, hundred feet tall. You know, so nine stories, maybe eight stories tall, plus something in the mechanical room. If the system is a hundred feet tall, I multiply that a hundred feet by 0.433 PSI per foot, which gives me the, the static water column now has a, a weight equivalent to 43.3 PSI at the bottom of the system, where this expansion tank, this fill valve are sitting, okay? Now, if I only fill it to 43.3, that means I have zero pounds of pressure at the top of the building. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna add an additional five pounds of positive pressure. So my 43.3 becomes 48.3. So I have 48.3 pounds. That makes sure that I have water all the way up to the system. And I have that five pounds of positive pressure on the top to prevent boiling and to make sure my vents are positive acting. So that's the minimum pressure in the system, okay? If I was doing maximum, okay, let's say this relief valve right here was rated for 80 PSI. If I had an 80 pound relief valve, that relief valve is going to start to weep about 5% under that 80. So all of a sudden, if, if at 80 PSI, the valve is fully open, at 86 point, I mean 86 PSI, that relief valve will start to a little bit of water out as it starts to weep. So the goal is to never reach that 86. So then what I would say is, okay, let's pull another 5% off of that. So let's call that 82 PSI. So when I'm doing, if I'm looking at that maximum pressure for the sizing of this expansion tank, the maximum pressure shouldn't exceed, I'm gonna round it down to get on a table, let's call it 80 PSI. So if I'm looking at the maximum operating pressure, it's all about making sure that stays seated that sets that maximum pressure. Minimum pressure, it's about how much building is above this, the fill valve and the expansion tank, and that sets that minimum pressure. So minimum, I gotta fill the building and have positive pressure on it. Maximum, in most cases, I'm gonna go most cases, it's about keeping this rel these relief valves seated. Unless there's something else in the system that has a pressure, I'm gonna throw that out as well. Unless there's something else in the building that has a pressure requirement. But when I look at it from the aspect of maximum and minimum, that's how I'm gonna approach it. Okay, I see we picked up another one, Miranda. Yes, we have uh, two more in here. The first one it says, uh, do we ever use expansion tanks in chilled water systems? Um, the answer is yes, um, because, uh, well, the, the answer is yes. However, with a chilled water system, you know, the process is, is, is kind of, is a little bit reversed because we're dropping the water temperature and the tanks tend to be smaller because with a chilled water system, we're not, going through the full change in, you know, we're not, we don't have that large fluctuation in temperature. You know, it may go from 70 degrees down to 40 degrees or 45 degrees on the chilled water. 
you know, so uh, it can do wilt chilled water. And I believe actually, if you um, if you pull out a cop, if you do download the copy of Amtrol's expansion um, engineering handbook, I believe it also does address chill water as well. All right, the next question, why do we use specifically five PSI? Um, five PSI is to ensure that worst case scenario, which is the boiler gets up to the fixed high limit temperature of 210 degrees, that we have sufficient margin to ensure that that water will not boil. Um, and it's, it's been a while since I pulled it up, but I want to say if I have five pounds of pressure on the system, I believe that pushes the boiling point up to 225 or 230 degrees Fahrenheit. So by having that five pounds of pressure, you've gained a margin of somewhere between 50 and 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, where that, that now the boiling point's been pushed well beyond that maximum temperature that you're going to achieve. So it's about pushing the boiling point up. And, and 5 PSI really is tied back to the 210. 210 to 212, it's very small margin. 210 to 225 or 230, much larger margin. And that's where that 5 PSI number comes from. All right, and we have one more question. With the system off, is the minimum system pressure the standing head pressure? Um, the actual standing, the minimum pressure is your standing head pressure plus that five PSI. So if I looked at the, the, the standing, the, the, the weight of the water column from the top of the system to the bottom of the system, that is, you know, if you think of that as your standing head pressure, that will generate zero PSI of pressure at the top of the system. So my minimum system pressure has to have that extra five PSI. So the minimum pressure is standing head pressure, if you will, static pressure in the system, plus that additional five on top of it to have that positive pressure. All right, looks like that is the last question, Jody. All right, so with that, before I hand it off to uh, Miranda, thank you all for attending this afternoon. It was great to sit down and talk about this with you. Please continue to uh, join our, our conversations. And uh, it's over to you, Miranda. Thank you, Jody. Just a few reminders before we close out. As stated, this will be recorded and put on the video library within the next two weeks or so. So you will be able to go rewatch this at that time. If you wanted the PDH credit, we will be sending out those certificates within five bits survey that will be sent to you by the end of the day today. If you think of any additional questions, my email is on the screen. Feel free to email me. We will be putting together a Q&A document with all of the associated answers and we'll send out to everyone in attendance today. And like Jody said, keep up with our new webinar schedules, hopefully getting posted within the next two weeks or so. And then we have the eventing strategies next week on June 2nd, if you'd like to join that feel free to head over to the Academy website to register at any time up until the start of the, those webinars. With that being said, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you for attending.